This month, the U.S. Senate will be immersed in debate about really tough questions. How much additional military aid should we give Ukraine in its fight against Russian invasion? How much additional military aid should be given to Israel in its fight against Hamas? How should our immigration laws be changed, if at all, to end the surge of unauthorized immigrants at our southern border with Mexico? Really tough questions. And just to make legislating that much harder, the debate will not come one at a time. It will be all at once. This is Wally Knox. Welcome to 2024 and the Political Conversation. A few months ago, Joe Biden decided to ask the Senate for $110 billion in additional aid focused on the military struggles of Ukraine and Israel. The Republican leadership responded by saying their condition for any new funding would be a thorough reorganization of the nation's immigration laws aimed at controlling the flood of illegal immigrants at the border. No agreement was reached by December 2023, so here we are in January of 2024 wrestling with those issues. With all due respect to the funding issues for Israel and Ukraine, the major political fight is over immigration. If agreement can be found on that, I suspect that agreement on the other issues will fall in line. Absent an immigration deal, it looks like Biden's most important international efforts will utterly collapse. Would Republicans then try to separately fund the Israeli defense measures because today it is Republicans, not Democrats, who all adore Israel? Or will Republicans survey the wreckage of Biden's immigration and foreign affairs initiatives and start running television ads about how weak and old Joe Biden is? We have one scientific way to answer that question. Wait and see. How did we get to this point? To orient ourselves, I asked Rui Teixeira to join us once again. Teixeira, with his co-author John Judas, recently published a blistering criticism of the Democratic Party, Where Have All the Democrats Gone?, Their new book is an essential look at the dilemmas facing the Democratic Party. Whether you are a progressive, a conventional liberal, or not a Democrat at all, if you're simply a perplexed American, to begin to understand today's politics, you must read their book and grapple with the questions it asks. Today, let's listen to my interview with Teixeira in which he discusses immigration. Your, your final four essays include a discussion of the whole immigration question. And it so happens that at the moment you and I are talking about this, there's a huge discussion going on in Congress and the White House on immigration issues. And it has just been revealed that the White House is in serious conversations with Chuck Schumer and with the Republican leadership in the Senate about a major overhaul of the border uh, security measures. Um, so the in your book, uh, you review the history of immigration issues and, and reach a, a conclusion. Why don't you walk us into that, and then let's turn back to 2024 and what Joe Biden is doing currently. Okay, uh, yes, yeah, so let's, let's cast our mind back, get in the Wayback Machine, and go back to the late 20th century and remember uh, how Democrats thought about immigration back then. La- labor had a big role in the Democratic Party, and labor's position on sort of uncontrolled immigration was that it was bad. Uh, it undercut unionization, it affected the low-wage labor market in a way that undercut people's wages, and this was something that needed to be not stopped completely, but it needed to be controlled. Um, and that's where you got the Jordan Commission, uh, Barbara Jordan, the famous Democrat from, from that era, who uh, co- chaired a commission that, that came up with a series of recommendations about um, tightening up the uh, border security situation, tightening up the immigration system, implementing E-Verify in a big way so you could tell when employers were using illegal immigrants and so on. It was not that 
hugely controversial at the time, including within the Democratic Party. The problem was, over time, its recommendations were ignored as the Democratic Party more and more seemed to go into a direction that was uh, relatively liberal and lax on the immigration issue, and they didn't want to do anything that would disturb some of the activist groups who were lobbying uh, the Democrats. And indeed, some of the unions decided they were better off trying to organize these people than trying to tighten up the immigration system. And labor's influence anyway in the Democratic Party was declining from the 70s through the 00s in a big way. So that working class anchor that might have provided a, a check on Democrats' more liberal tendencies on immigration basically ceased to have much of an effect. And over time, we found the Democrats moving in a direction that basically was much less interested in trying to stem the flow of illegal immigrants, certainly not very interested in implementing E-Verify. And as a result, we did see uh, a surges in immigration in the OOs, and now we're experiencing another one right now. Uh, and we did see uh, immigration come to affect the low-wage labor market, and it probably did further erode unionization and so on. And right now, we know that um, the issue of immigration is a very important issue. We had President Trump in 2016, to some extent, because he ran on the immigration issue, and a lot of working class people were pissed off about it. Uh, and they're still pissed off today because the whole thing has come back in a major way to be in the news and quite obvious what's going on. Even immigrants are even being sent to lots of parts of the country where they previously had not uh, had a presence and they got to be taken care of and they're very visible. People believe, in, people believe the United States is a nation. They believe nations need to control their borders. And if they have a sense the borders are not being controlled, and basically anyone who wants to come in can figure out a way to game the system and get in, and the Democrats are complicit in that, this is an extremely poor look for the Democrats. But again, back to how bubbled up a lot of Democrats are, which has contributed to the Democrats' evolving attitude on immigration, it's kind of like, well, the only reason anyone would object to porous borders is because they're a xenophobe. They don't like black and brown people. That's why they don't want them coming. It's all cultural. They don't like the glorious multiracial, multicultural future we're moving into. And that's all there is to it, as if it's not actually a real policy issue that people might care about. Um, one, one thing I always like to uh, mention in this context, Wally, is that Trump ran the policy-oriented campaign in 2016. He talked a ton about trade. He talked a ton about immigration. He talked about jobs going overseas. He talked about the elites who don't care about working-class people. What did Hillary Clinton talk about? How bad Donald Trump is and the awful things he said and how you know, he's, he's not a nice man. Um, these were very different campaigns. Um, I, and, I remember vividly watching Clinton commercial after Clinton commercial. They were very fond of the one where they, they did a clever thing, which was they filmed children watching Donald Trump on television. And these children all were reacting with stunned horror at what they were seeing. And the, the voiceovers were something like, moms and dads, do you want your kids exposed to Donald Trump for four years? As for something along those lines. And I was watching those ads saying, well, those are clever in a, in a clever sort of a way but what the heck does that have to do right with, yeah it's too clever by half you know too clever <laughs> by half too sophisticated um yeah so that's a good example of of uh, how clueless a lot of because these are people who are making these ads they're they're supposedly smart democratic operatives but i i don't i think it's hard for them to think outside of their own cultural context in a way David Shore has talked about this in some of the interviews he's given over the years, so just how clueless a lot of Democratic operatives and consultants are uh, and how they're not paying attention to how effective their ads actually are and the tr cultural tropes they may or may not be endorsing and how they may or may not be um, viewed favorably by ordinary voters. So, yeah, this is a big deal. And now here we are in, in 2023, moving into 2024, and the Democrats are having a hard, hard time making what should be an easy choice for them. Let's tighten up border security. Everybody knows the system is broken. Biden has a 23% approval rating on handling border security. Um, and we can get aid for the Ukraine and Israel if we make this deal where we tighten up the border, tighten up the asylum system, do something about the parole situation, implement some sort of renewed Remain in Mexico policy. I mean, one can argue about the details here. 
But what's held up the deal so far, and maybe they're just about to make one, because I think they see the writing on the wall, the Biden administration, they realize they have to do something, um, is the enormous pressure that's put on the administration from the left of the party and from the activist groups who don't want any tightening up of border security. <laughs> zero. They'd be, <laughs> they'd be happy with zero. They'd be happy with a more liberal system. So they're fighting tooth and nail against what should be common sense tweaks to the immigration system, which granted needs to be completely overhauled and changed, but that's not going to happen right now anyway. But you could take this opportunity to develop a somewhat better image on the immigration issue and get a little bit closer where the median voter is coming from. Republicans are giving you an opportunity to do this. You should take it, but I just think it shows the influence of the shadow party on today's Democrats that they're having such a difficult time doing it. Well, we'll see. We'll see how that pans out. At, at this hour of this day, we, we really don't know. Yesterday, to dip into the facts and to educate myself as to why the border crossing issue has emerged so strongly now, um, I went online to the customs and uh, uh, the customs website and pulled up the facts on what they call encounters at the border. And and. and Encounters at the border is their terminology for uh, illegal crossings that are detected by the service. In the last three months of Donald Trump's presidency, there were an average of about 72,000 encounters each month. Then in the first three months of Biden's administration, the counts went this way. January, his first month, 78,000. February, 101,000. March 173,000 and then over the la the past year in the administration the number of encounters has grown to 206,000 on the average every month it's almost tripled and is at an annual rate of about two and a half million um, and you're right the point you made is uh, earlier is right major cities like New York City are being swamped, inundated with migrants that they simply cannot handle. And we're having mayors of major cities call on the administration to do something to help them. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's pretty remarkable, isn't it? I mean, I remember too, uh, maybe you remember this too, Wally, at the beginning of this surge at the border after Biden um, took over uh, they rescinded some of Trump's policies and just generally sent a message that we're going to be a lot more humane and nice at the border. Now, if I'm someone who want to come to the United States, I hear that I say, hey, this means it's easier to get in. And by God, it was. So, I mean, shouldn't have surprised anybody that a lot more people started showing up. Uh, and that's continued throughout the admitted. But I remember when it first started. I don't know if you remember this. It was like, oh, it's a seasonal thing. This always happens. It's it's. It's transitory. It's just like inflation. It's, it's transitory. It'll go away. <laughs> and boy, did that not happen. So, uh, you know, it's just, it's just amazing the ability of, you know, sort of politicians and, and the people who support them in and around the Democratic Party to deny reality and ascribe it to misinformation that people are absorbing rather than looking at the facts as they really are. I call this the Fox News fallacy. <laughs> I would disagree with you at, at one point, and that is I think that 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 misthinking is endemic among political activists of all stripes. The, the, uh, I always joke, uh, we are not rational animals. Uh, we are rationalizing animals. We can rationalize just about anything we try to do. But you're right. Yeah, confirmation bias. Yep. Confirmation yep. bias. I am confirmed in what I think. And it pops up all over the place. It's the hardest thing in the world, hardest thing in the world, to disabuse yourself of that for a single moment and gain some clarity on these issues, which is why I so heartily recommend your book to folks. So we don't know what's going to happen on the border crossing issue. We don't even know exactly what the Biden administration is dickering with on this moment, but... Uh, could you sketch for us what you would let's let's pull away from 2024 for a moment and go back and just summarize for us the broad strokes of what you see as a viable democratic 
immigration policy for the future. And let's dis, dis, let's distance ourselves from the border crossing issue, which is volatile, volatile issue. But it's not the heart of what's going on in the immigration issue. What are the ideas you see that were developed by the party early on that uh, were never implemented fully um, and could be the basis of really productive reform? Right. Well, that that's a big question. And obviously, I should point out, I'm not an immigration policy expert, nor do I play one on TV. But um, my basic take, I guess, would be uh, as follows. Um, I guess one initial point to make is it's probably a fair point that the country needs more immigrants. Immigrants are good for the country by and large. There is a reasonable argument to be made about labor shortages and fertility declines and all this is yes we should have more rather than fewer immigrants but if we are going to have more immigrants then we have to have a system that allows them to come in legally it's not a policy to have people coming illegally and supposedly you know helping us with our labor shortages that's not a policy that's um that's sort of political and policy malpractice more i'd say so if you're going to sell immigration, in other words, you're going to sell more immigration to the American people, make a case, get it through Congress, make it work politically. You know, end of story. So, which actually brings us, speaking of making it work politically, I think another thing that's important about the whole immigration policy issue is realistically, this has to be a bipartisan deal. The idea that Democrats are going to get everything, you know, their preferred immigration system, which unfortunately frequently looks like what the activist groups pull for, through is ridiculous. You're going to have to do some trade-offs here. Now, maybe Democrats aren't enthusiastic about border security. I mean, I disagree with that on substantive terms. But politically, you're not going to get any deal in immigration that does something for the people already in the country, provides them with a path to citizenship, boosts legal immigration totals in certain ways. You're not going to get any deal whatsoever unless you're willing to compromise and implement an actual border security system that keeps illegal immigrants out of the country. You're going to have to radically reform the asylum system so it's actually truly for people who need what we used to think of as asylum from political persecution and things like that. You're going to have to get rid of this ridiculous parole system. They have this variety of ways in which people essentially can be moved into the country and wind up staying here for indefinite periods of time despite the fact they're illegal and it's facilitated by a lot of the ways the asylum and parole system and so on work. You've got to turn away a lot of these people at the border. We probably do need something like a Remain in Mexico policy and things like that. There's a lot of complicated details to this, but the bottom line has to be keep illegal immigrants out, tighten up the system so that the people who come in under asylum are actually people who deserve asylum, plausibly. And, uh, you know, that uh, if there are cases that need to be adjudicated, they get adjudicated fast. Releasing people into the United States with a court date three years from now does not work and has not worked. So I guess what I'm proposing here is a broad reform of the immigration system that sets up specific parameters for illegal immigration that could be different than what we have now and perhaps should be more skewed toward high-skill immigrants rather than low-skill immigrants. That's something we should think about. That's what the Canadians have. There's a variety of policy questions here that would have to be resolved, but I think the way to reform the immigration system is to deal with all those issues, border security, levels of legal immigration between high skill and low skill, and also, of course, a path to citizenship for the people already here. Now, the last part is what Democrats typically mean by immigration reform. <laughs> yeah, let's just take the people who are here illegally and let's figure out a way to, uh, to make them legal. Okay, that's fine. I agree with that to a large extent. There, there needs to be some system that speaks to that. But the other two things have to be spoken to and about. You have to have a real immigration system uh, that lets in le legal people in the mix that you want, and you have to have actually tight border security that might include uh, you know, not only what happens at the border, but also for people who do manage to flip through the net and employers employ them. You know, let's go back to the future. What, whatever happened to E-Verify? Why was that such a terrible idea? Why should people who are illegal immigrants have jobs in the United States and, you know, that employers will take advantage of to pay them low wages? So, again, the devil's in the details here, but I think all those things had to be thought about. Let's just pause because E-Verify was a viable political issue 
uh, about three million political years ago, which means last month. Uh, just quickly explain to folks what you're talking about there. Well, basically, the idea is there should be possible to set up a system where when employers employ a worker, it has to be verified there. They are, in fact, a legal resident of the United States. That's not that hard to do. And this was recommended by the Jordan Commission 40 years ago. Yeah. Um, but it was never implemented in any serious way. Pre-internet was, recommendation. Pre-internet, right. Now, now we actually, it should be, it's a lot easier to do this because information technology is so much better. I mean, this, this could be set up tomorrow. Yeah. But, of course, the resistance to it is fierce. By the way, I wanted to point out that uh, your point about um, having uh, border uh, security issues, which would deny access to the border entirely to folks to return people across the border right away, is apparently among the package that the Biden administration is offering Republican leadership. Um, of course, tomorrow they could deny <laughs> they could de- deny that they, they, they ever offered the it. Oath they ever said it. Yeah. So. Uh... Right. Well, let's hope. You know, let's hope. I mean, I think the pressure on them is is pretty big to come up with something here, and we'll see if they. Well, you, you don't have to. You know, the whole caging children separate from their parents stuff simply has to go. But at the same time, that goes there. There's a, a rationale to saying we can we can have a secure border. Sure. Well, the whole thing with um, uh, caging children and all that was a massive public relations triumph for the immigration lobby because they took that clearly awful thing and basically blew it up to be the entire issue of immigration, which of course it isn't. Uh, And I think successfully convinced a lot of people that we really shouldn't have much border security because look what happens to the kids. But I think that was, again, a sort of public relations triumph for that particular lobby in a certain wing of the Democratic Party. When I'm thinking about immigration issues, it helps me to categorize the issues into two basic categories. One is national prosperity issues. Um, Those revolve around how many people overall do we want to admit at any particular time? Um, Do we care about the skill level of those folks, et cetera, et cetera, those kinds of issues. It's all about, that is about national prosperity. The other completely viable and very important uh, issue is the humanitarian reasons for allowing immigration, and those are real also. But so much of the time, the discussion about uh, immigration never really, uh, never separates the two, never looks at the two separately, never explains clearly that those are different values, different motivations, and require a, a different set of standards. And for me, it's helpful uh, to do that. Yeah. Now, that, that's a good point and a good way of thinking about it. And there's a third category that actually most illegal immigrants fall into the bucket of and have nothing to do with the, the, the two pl- things you mentioned is economic. The overwhelming proportion of illegal immigrants are economic. They want to come here because it provides a better life. Who can blame them? You know, if I was in a poor country beset by social disorder, I'd probably think about moving to the United States and whether I could get in legally or illegally. Not, not uh, pertinent to me, especially if I think it's relatively easy to cross the border without being legal. So this is just a reality that countries, rich countries face today. Many more people want to come especially to the United States, then can possibly be admitted. So there has to be a system for deciding who gets in and who does not. That's not cruel. It's just being rational. I'm here today because my grandfather, Antonio Nuzzo, raised in an impoverished hill community outside Naples, Italy, wanted to come to the United States so intensely that he came earned a little money, went back, showed off how much money he'd made in the States, what came back to the United States, went back home to show off, and and eventually married a a gal from back home and brought her to the United States. And the rest is history. (laughs) The rest is here. Here I am today. But yeah, Southern Italy uh, was not a place where there was a lot of economic opportunity uh, in 1900, and Antonio Nuzzo wanted to go to a place where he could get ahead, and he could raise a family, and his kids could get ahead. Well, it's the, it's the American story. We just need to 
you know, have an American story for today that's a little bit more orderly uh, than, it, than it currently is. Um, but yeah, the, the nation's strength has always risen to some extent on the backs of immigrants. So I'm sure the future will be no different. But that doesn't mean that a, the non-system we have today is the way to do it. So let me, let me turn our conversation away from the, the nitty gritty that we've been dealing with here and, uh, and much more to the long term. Um, I'll just say straight out, correct me if I'm wrong, you and Judas write your, in your book that you're writing proposals that you think are for the long term. Um, it, will, it will take, who knows, two, three, four election cycles for there to be enough discussion inside the Democratic Party to wrestle with these things, for there to be any chance of major shifts going on. Um, but, and let, but let me challenge you on this. You, you, you write and speak in a very blunt fashion. <laughs> Is that, on your part, calculated as a way to sort of splash water on the face of Democrats like me and say, wake up? I, I, I think there's, yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's something to that. Uh, I mean, the background here for this would be I spent almost 20 years at the Center for American Progress being, you know, maybe a bit of a maverick, but still mostly a, a loyal soldier in the army. And I kept on like tugging on people's sleeves, trying to talk to them about some of this stuff, but not really writing about it publicly. Like you're really underestimating your problems with working class voters here. There's actually a lot of things Democrats are getting into these days that are not going to sell well with these voters and, and frankly aren't even really good policy ideas anyway. Um, so after I left CAP, and well, I really started writing in the Liberal Patriot before I left CAP, um, I just decided this is ridiculous. I don't think the Democratic Party as it's currently constituted is fit for purpose. It's not capable of forming a dominant majority coalition that is going to get the stuff done they want to get done over the long term. So why not? just say what I actually think is true and what the data, in my view, indicate and let the chips fall where they may. I think it's going to be a while for Democrats to reorder themselves in a way that, that gives themselves a better chance of becoming that party of the common man and woman again, of the ordinary American. But I think that should be the goal. That's why John and I wrote the book. I mean, and I don't rule out the Republicans themselves could, could change uh, in this way over the the medium to long term. Right now, it doesn't look too good, what with Trump and all. But there are, there are interesting signs within the Republican Party and its intellectual orbit of people who are thinking more about how, how to do that. And that reflects the fact they're more of a working class party than they used to be. Their base has changed. Um, and I think their commitment to neoliberalism, just like the Democrats, has, has eroded. I mean, that was one thing that Trump did, is he blew up the economic consensus in the Republican Party. So all this is to say that I think this is a fluid time politically. I think nothing is settled, really. I mean, the parties are basically at a stalemate now, and they're not going to be able to get out of that stalemate until one of the other parties, and John and I think the Democrats are a better bet, really comes to terms with its own weaknesses and figures out a way to move forward uh, uh, toward a, a goal of a, a really broad and dominant majority. Um, and to some extent jettisons a lot of the things that are holding, holding it back. So I don't, yeah, I guess I just don't see any percentage these days with pulling my punches about this stuff. Um, it is what it is. You know, don't shoot me. I'm just a messenger. So. <laughs> well, you're a very, very fascinating messenger. So uh, I hi highly recommend folks take a dose of Teixeira and Judas and uh, pick up a copy of um, where have all the Democrats gone? You'll find out an awful lot about where all the Democrats have gone. Uh, thanks very much for talking with us today. 